I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75, the question of which would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter was received from Senator Dodson. Pursuant to standing order, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The division and dysfunction within the Morrison government with the Prime Minister's preference for net zero emissions by 2050 countered by the statement of Nationals leader Mr Barnaby Joyce that the Nationals have always been opposed to a net zero target. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. I'm, is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. And with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Um, what a week uh, it has been, uh, really. And while uh, this place has been focused internally, as it always is, uh, and the National Party has been focused uh, on itself. We've seen a couple of themes emerge uh, from the fracas, the self-absorbed, self-indulgent, self-interested fracas inside the National Party. The only uniting theme that these characters can design that explains their behaviour is their opposition to the Prime Minister's crab walking towards the most basic of commitments. Uh, around climate change, emissions, energy and jobs, and the capacity of those opposite to develop a policy framework is so weak, so poor, that they have had 19 different energy policy frameworks over the course of the last eight years. Now, according to the movie review aggregator Rotten Tomatoes, the worst movie that ever got a sequel was the 1999 flop Baby Geniuses, a favourite of Senator McGrath's, I'm told. The critics' consensus read, flat direction and actors who look embarrassed to be on screen make baby geniuses worse than the premise suggests. Not dissuaded from their 2 per cent Rotten Tomatoes score, 2004 saw the release of Super Babies Baby Geniuses 2 which received a 0 per cent score. The critics' consensus read, a startling lack of taste pervades Super Babies, a sequel offering further proof that bad jokes still aren't funny when coming from the mouths of babes. And so we turn to the modern National Party and rejoicing Barnaby Mark II. This week has seen the return, un unheralded, Unwanted. Senator Ayres, it was a fairly difficult reference, but you were referring to a member of the other place. Yes. And in this contribution from here on in, I expect you to refer to them in the proper way. Mr. Joyce, the member for New England, is who I was referring to. So if, if, uh, if that assists, I will absolutely do that. So this week has seen uh, Mr. Joyce's return. The first, the original, was bad. What will the sequel bring? Today's MPI debate is about the new and old Deputy Prime Minister's position on the target of net zero by 2050. So the Prime Minister has been experimenting with his climate rhetoric this year. I say experimenting because nobody knows quite what the Prime Minister means. The Prime Minister of Britain and the Liberal backbench certainly think that he means one thing the National Party believes another. And surely Australian people, ordinary people, who overwhelmingly demand a sensible approach on climate and emissions and jobs and energy, have no chance at all of understanding what on earth it is that the Prime Minister is talking about. When the Prime Minister says it is his preference to get to net zero by 2050, what on earth does he mean? When he says new energy economy, what are the real-world policy consequences for people? The Prime Minister is so tied up in his own spin that nobody knows what he means, least of all himself. But the once and future leader of the National Party has had some interesting observations about a net zero emissions target. Last month he published an opinion piece in the Northern Daily Leader outlining his thoughts, the thought leader of the National Party. 
And given that the Prime Minister will finally have to sit down and negotiate a fresh iteration of this secret coalition agreement, it's worth some close examination. The title of this opinion piece, Climate Socialism Will Trump Private Rights. Unfortunately, it takes about half of the op-ed to get to climate change. But firstly, we've got past what passes for amateur philosophy from the member for New England. He says, the cornerstone of a modern franchise of freedom relies on the state to protect private ownership. The disenfranchisement of freedom relies on the state imposing on your ability to act independently. It's got the kind of overheated quality of someone trying to prove that they had done that week's readings. Then he goes on to say, COVID itself has been brilliant at the disenfranchisement of personal freedoms. You can't travel from one place of no disease to another of no disease because of the dictates of the state. What on earth does this bloke mean? What on earth does he mean? It's the kind of febrile stuff that's out there on the funny old chat rooms the ultra-right chat rooms out there. And then he goes on to say, the conservative side of politics has to be the champion of private ownership. The power of the state deadens the dynamics of the individual, which paradoxically makes the nation weaker than it would be if it was freer. What on earth is this rubbish from this bloke? But this is what passes for ideology for the bloke who wants to be the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. I was informed by my staff that the Weatherboard 9 podcast—remember that, you'd all be on it, the Weatherboard 9 po podcast—Mr Joyce and Senator Canavan, we never know which one's Weatherboard and which one's Iron. We do know that that particular podcast, even for young right-wingers, the kind of characters who sit in their basements listening to this kind of stuff, even for them it puts the board into Weatherboard. I was informed that Weatherboard 9 is 40 minutes of this kind of rubbish. Finally, he begins to ramp up to a point. The discussions about the proposed 2050 zero emissions target will impose on the individual the next raft of caveats. Once again, it will stand next to the moralistic framed existential crisis of global warming. This impossible journey to zero emissions can only be embarked on with a whole new raft of impositions on private assets. I mean, really, not even Senator Rennick would understand what that was all about. It must be a surprise to the National Farmers Federation, who have endorsed a net zero by 2050 target. It would have to be a surprise to Meat and Livestock Australia, who are planned to achieve net zero by the end of the decade. It goes on, climate socialism will trump private rights long before it would or could have any effect on the mercury. I mean, this is just free form, like a sort of uh, hallucinogenic trip uh, that Mr Joyce is unfolding here. The state will look to you, he says, for thanks that you can now go to Anzac Day or church. Net zero emissions, according to Mr Joyce, is going to take Anzac Day away. How on earth can the Prime Minister come to agreement with a man who thinks that net zero emissions is the equivalent of the villain from Braveheart. How can the Prime Minister hammer out a deal with a man who thinks that net zero emissions is going to steal Christmas? Well, Mr Joyce, Mr Joyce doesn't represent farmers. He doesn't fight for country communities. He only stands up for one person. Mr Joyce will only ever stand up for Mr Joyce. And I find the Deputy Prime Minister's rhetoric particularly unusual, considering his track record as Agriculture Minister. He's very exercised about property rights when he's in the local paper, but he's much more flexible about property rights when it comes to the National Party's role in the Murray-Darling Basin. When Four Corners exposed that billions of litres of water had been stolen from the Bowen Darling, the then Minister for Agriculture, who's responsible for this scheme, was entirely unconcerned. He said, it's an issue overwhelmingly for New South Wales, an echo of the Prime Minister's approach to vaccine delivery or quarantine. 
But to an audience of irrigators that night, he told the truth. He said, we've taken water, put it back into agriculture so we can look after you and make sure we don't have the greenies running the show. Well, it wasn't put back into agriculture. It was put back into mates of the National Party. Some bits of agriculture got the benefit of that very loose approach to water allocations. Is it any surprise that it barely took a week of his return for the National Party to start undermining the agreement that shares our nation's rivers? Their surprise amendments in the Senate bring the $13 billion Murray-Darling Basin Plan to the brink of destruction, pitting farmer against farmer and state against state. It's a self-indulgent display from a self-indulgent party led by a self-indulgent man. His paranoid vision of personal freedom comes at great cost to country Australians, to Australian agriculture and ultimately to all of us. Senator Small. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'd like something from Sesame Street. Today's MPI seems to be brought to us by the number 2050 and the letter D. D for division and dysfunction over there on the Labor benches, because the Labor Party will do anything, it seems, to paint over their own internal divisions, whether it's on coal, on gas, on energy, on emissions reductions and the investments that this government seeks to make and they stand between. Labor talk a big game about a climate emergency, but in the same breath they vote against solutions and the necessary steps that we seek to take. Not 24 hours ago in this chamber, the Labor Party sided with the Greens to vote against $192.5 million in additional funding for ARENA, and that's investment in Australian innovation. They voted against more EV and hydrogen charging stations. They voted against more energy efficiency and a competitive heavy industry in Australia. They voted against carbon capture and storage, and they voted against their own national policy platform, which they adopted not even 90 days ago at their federal conference. Meanwhile, we are seeking to take real and practical action to deliver lower emissions whilst we protect our economy, we protect our jobs and we protect investment in Australian businesses. We have strong targets. We have an enviable track record and a clear plan. Our, uh, sorry, our approach is driven by technology, not taxes. So we are not divided, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. We are very unified that our plan will deliver lower emissions, protect Australian industry, protect Australian jobs, and the only thing that stands between that and realising it is the Labor Party. Emissions are at their lowest level since 1990 when records began. But that hasn't been uh, you know, brought about by a massive increase in the power prices that Australians pay. Indeed, wholesale power prices are at their lowest level in nine years, following 19 straight months of falls from the introduction of the big stick legislation that this government introduced. Household retail prices are 11.2 per cent lower than they were a year ago, and we are delivering the needed investment through the Snowy 2.0 and the Curry Curry gas power station to ensure that Australians pay affordable energy prices today and tomorrow. This is a government, Mr Acting Deputy President, that recognises that whilst ambition is important, achievement and outcomes are actually what matter. We are one of a handful of countries in the world to have beaten our Kyoto-era commitments. We beat our 2020 target by some 459 million tonnes. And not only that, our emissions have fallen faster than the G20 average, faster than the OECD average and much faster than similar developed economies like Canada and New Zealand. So again, Mr Acting Deputy President, this is a government that is unified with a strong track record and a plan that the Labor Party oppose. On a per-person basis, our 2030 target is more ambitious than those of France, Germany, Canada, New Zealand or Japan. So we have an ambitious target, we have a, a, a proactive policy agenda, and that is an ambition but not a cap. We want to meet and exceed those targets. 
The latest emissions projections, published as recently as December 2020, show that we are on track to do exactly that. As the Prime Minister has said, we are a nation that wants to get to net zero, and preferably by 2050. But we're committed to doing that through technology and not taxes. That's the approach that's yielded results so far, and it hasn't sacrificed jobs and industries on the altar of labour vanity. Instead, this government is focused on the how, and that how is breakthroughs in technology that will be needed to make net zero emissions possible here and around the world. Updated forecasts uh, with respect to our 2030 Paris targets show that we are uh, improving our baseline position by some 639 million tonnes, which, as I told the chamber yesterday, is equivalent to taking Australia's 14.7 million cars—that's every car in the nation—off the road for some 15 years. But not only that, focused on the, uh, focused on the present, we have an impressive plan. We've, we've got momentum leading into Australia's technology investment roadmap, uh, and our commitment is clear. We're going to keep electricity prices low, we're going to keep the lights on, and we're going to be doing our bit to reduce global emissions without wrecking the economy. These are the results that we're seeing thus far, and this is the plan that we have. Advancing that next generation of low emissions technologies is crucial to actually fully realising our plan under the Paris Agreement. But that's exactly what was voted against by both Labor and the Greens yesterday. Not only did they vote against $192.5 million of investment in renewable technology, they also voted against 1,400 green jobs here in Australia. Australia's experience has been that when new technologies are economically competitive, Australians take them up at a great rate. And that's why here in Australia we're seeing the adoption of renewable uh, energy at 10 times the global average, four times faster than China, Japan, US and Europe as a whole. Australia now has the highest solar capacity of any country in the world. And that's where we can go with our technology roadmap, that comprehensive plan to ensure that not only do we realise the benefits of the technologies today, but we continue to realise those benefits tomorrow. So accelerating technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, carbon soil measurement, low carbon materials in steel and aluminium and long duration energy storage are the sorts of innovations that will unlock emissions reductions into the, into the future. And that's exactly what was opposed in this chamber last night by those who seem to have forgotten it with this fallacious MPI today. So Australian electricity prices are coming down. Emissions are coming down. Jobs are secure. Industry is developing. Technology is developing. And we're future-proofing our energy markets with a gas-fired recovery as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our competitive advantage as a nation has always been premised on cheap, reliable energy. And gas is fundamental to that as we move through a transition to a net neutral future, preferably by 2050. Our comprehensive plan of 13 measures in the gas market to establish an open and competitive hub model based on the Henry Hub will in fact unlock supply, ensure efficient transportation and empower consumers importantly, because this is an industry that employs more than 900,000 Australians, Mr Acting Deputy President, and we will not risk their jobs and their economic security with a big taxing, big government agenda like those opposite. Labor are completely divided by this issue, and this motion is yet another attempt on their part to paper over the cracks over there, to distract from their complete lack of energy and climate policy action where it counts. They all talk about targets and ambitions, but they have no plan to get there. The contrast to this government with both a strong track record, a world-beating story to tell and a plan to take us to a net neutral future couldn't be starker. Labor can't tell you how much their policies will reduce emissions by. They can't tell you how many jobs it will cost. 
They can't tell you how many more electric vehicles we'll have on our roads or, indeed, if we'll have carbon capture and storage at all. But yesterday, in this place, they all lined up over there to vote against $192.5 million of investment and 1,400 jobs in this important space. That is something that, I ref that, that reflects that the Labor Party are all at sea when it comes to energy policy, when it comes to being net neutral, preferably by 2050, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Labor Party oppose our Curry Curry gas-fired project. They voted against our arena investments, and yet they've got no plan and no story to tell. With that, I think Australians can be very confident that it's the Morrison government that will protect their jobs, that will keep their power prices low, that will keep their jobs safe and will deliver uh, the sort of future uh, that our children would want to see. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. You're, uh, you're from a very proud farming background. Uh, my father was a farmer and I was even a farmer myself for nearly 15 years. And farmers grow things. Farmers understand that one of the most critical variables for their success is the climate, uh, is the weather. And there's something going on with the climate, Acting Deputy President. It's called climate change. Some people call it global warming. There's a lot of names for it. And it's a scientific fact that the planet is warming. And as the planet warms, we get more extremes in our weather, which presents more risk for farmers. Now, if you ask a farmer what is one of the biggest risks to their enterprises, they'll probably say in different parts of the country different things. Certainly in large parts of the country, it's drought. It's lack of rainfall. No, no, no disputes around that. We may say pests and diseases or biosecurity risks uh, in other parts of the country. Some may say heat waves. Some may say flooding. So on and so forth. Even fire is a severe risk now to many agricultural enterprises. All these things are linked to our changing climate. Yes, they've been there throughout our history, but the science is indisputable and undeniable. The variability is changing. Our ecosystems and habitats are changing. So farmers have to adapt. For a party to claim that they represent farmers in this place, the National Party, in coalition with the Liberal Party, for that party to claim they represent farmers and not have a clue on climate change. In fact, I take that back. They actually do have a clue on climate change. They don't believe it's real. They don't believe it's man-made. They don't believe that we need to act. It's a total betrayal of the Australian farming community. Farmers want climate action, and it's been great to see in recent days the farming community calling out the Liberal National Party uh, on this duplicity. Now, I would like to say today that I believe taking action on climate change is an opportunity for farmers, a significant opportunity. And I did find it very interesting this morning when I read, and of course this is, uh, this is all hearsay in the media, that uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce is interested in doing a deal with uh, Mr Morrison, provided farmers get paid for taking climate action. So I would like to talk about an initiative that the Greens and Labor government brought in. When the carbon price was established in 2011, an offset market was simultaneously established called the Carbon Farming Initiative, which allowed land managers to secure carbon on their land and then sell those permits to the polluting entities liable to pay the carbon price. It was a way to encourage farmers and incentivise farmers to reduce Australians' emissions through financial rewards, because agriculture wasn't covered by the carbon price. In 2012, the Labor Green government agreed to amend the package to enable Australia's carbon market to link with the European Union's carbon market commencing from 1 July 2015. Had this proceeded, it would have enabled Australian farmers to turn their marginal land into more productive income-generating assets through changed agricultural practices and revegetation to earn carbon credits. During the two years of the scheme, Australian farmers and land managers produced 1.9 million tonnes of abatement worth as much as $43 million, assuming a $23 carbon price. However, once the Abbott LNP government 
uh, pulled the package and cancelled climate action, as they did right across the board. The opportunity for farmers for export revenues was removed. Now, we've done a, an analysis that the actual total cost to farmers had this uh, carbon farming initiative proceeded is approximately $12.4 billion over the last five years. And we know the EU have put this back on the table in our negotiations, and the US administration is also talking about potentially penalising Australia because of our lack of carbon initiatives. And of course, if Senator, ex Senator Joyce, uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce in the other place, our Deputy Prime Minister, wants a good scheme, wants a good initiative, he has to look no further than this carbon farming initiative, because we could easily bring it back. Uh, in fact, that's something I think we should do, and then maybe we can have this debate about how we can turn uh, climate action into a significant uh, opportunity for farmers. I think it's also worth talking about the costs of inaction, the costs of political inaction. Uh, Acting Deputy President, every environmental problem Every environmental problem we encounter is first and foremost a political problem. It might come from a business activity, it might come uh, from a business decision, it can come from a whole range of things, but it is the role of government. It is the role of government. It shows us how much you don't understand, Senator Scar. If the natural events linked to climate change and rising emissions, that's come from a business activity. A natural event like an extreme weather event, has come from rising emissions. It's called global warming, which comes from a business activity, just to reinforce that for your, for your benefit. Governments have a role to price externalities. Governments have a role to regulate business decisions that cause environmental problems. I challenge you to find one that doesn't have its source in economic or business activity. And if it's a government's role to solve these problems, if it's a government's role to solve these problems, then that's what we need to do, and that's not what we're doing. This government has been in place now for nine years and has had no policy on climate change, no policy at all, and it shows. As we saw with the UNESCO yesterday, uh, it's been recognised by the world that Australia has a lot more to contribute in the global leadership uh, arena of climate change acting on emissions, acting on uh, stopping fossil fuel projects, acting on having binding targets, not only for 2050, weak 2050 targets, but for 2030. And coming up with unicorn technologies and delaying tactics and distracting tactics is not going to get the job done. It's what we've seen for the last decade. It's simply unacceptable to go down this road. And the people who will, be, will suffer the most are farmers, Senator. acting deputy president. Senator Stirling. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Uh, look, I rise to make my contribution on this debate too. And I want to go back a couple of steps. And I want to go back a couple of steps to a couple of weeks ago when the Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison, was off to visit the Queen in London. And he was on his world tour and he was doing some G7 stuff and off he went. And he gets to London and then uh, we, we saw that he had a large entourage of media, a huge media contingent following him, and then there was one big blank space on the diary, which no one knew what was going on, and we saw, because the local Cornwall Bugle had leaked out the story, none of the Aussie media, uh, uh, media were supposed to know about this, but this is, see, this is typical of our Prime Minister. Our Prime Minister continually likes to keep things secret. And we know that from when Australia was on fire and we were trying to find, we as a nation were trying to find the leader, the Prime Minister, where is he? When he was holidaying in Hawaii. Now, not that that's a problem holidaying in Hawaii, but whoever thinks it's a great idea to holiday in Hawaii while the nation's on fire and then tell everyone to keep it quiet, I don't know where his political radar is. But once again, his lack of political radar, I'm talking about the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, pops up again in Cornwall, where he's off to visit some grave sites, which a lot of families in Australia would love the opportunity to go overseas, not only to visit grave sites, like Mr Morrison was finding his 37th removed great-grandfather or something I don't quite know, and I'm led to believe he didn't find anything, so he went looking for a long-lost cousin who died at birth or something. I'm not quite sure. But 
Hello and behold, the Cornwall Bugle took a photo of the Prime Minister actually popping in to the local Cornwall pub, having a watercress sandwich and a pint. Nothing wrong with a pint of beer. Nothing wrong with a pint of beer. Everyone's got to eat. But once again, what sort of image does that send back to Australia? What sort of where, where in the, uh, uh, let alone a Prime Minister, even us humble uh, senators would think, where is this smart to think? Our nation has been in lockdown. Our nation has closed off overseas. Well, closed off on most people going overseas and most people coming back, depending on who you are. Some people seem to get out all right and some people seem to get back in. And If you're playing sport, well, then you can run around. That doesn't matter. That's another story or, or tennis or something like that. What message did that send to the Australian public that there's our Prime Minister with his watercress sandwich and his pint wandering around a graveyard but making sure none of the Australian media knew that this was a good idea? when we have thousands of stranded Australians desperate to get back to our country, their home, Australian citizens, they can't get back here. There's many, many relatives who are desperate to come back and see family. And we all know someone. We've, we've all got all us senators and the, the, that mob on the other side have all been written to on many occasions about families being separated and not being able to get back. But our tactless uh, uh, radarless Prime Minister and God Almighty, he, I don't know if his advisers were pulling their hair out or they were kept in the dark too. I probably think they're good people. They just had no idea. Well, he, he told them to shut up and don't say a word. Where in the hell does this all come from? A leader of a nation. So we shouldn't be surprised. Although it did raise one eyebrow at me and Senator, oh, the Deputy President, uh, Acting Deputy President, you and I have been through a lot of shenanigans in this building, not you and I personally, but we have witnessed, and if we did I wouldn't tell anyone anyway, Deputy, Deputy President, but we have witnessed many shenanigans and disruptions and knives after dark and backstabbing and leaders falling and others rising up and careers being destroyed. We've seen many of these. But I did raise my eyebrows when I saw, well, there's the Prime Minister in London visiting the Queen and some, some rocks or something. And at the same time, tweeting out he was going to meet with the US President, and I'd be pretty proud if I was the Prime Minister having a one-on-one -on -one with the US President. And lo and behold, that didn't even happen. He, he ended up in a threesome. Okay, we know that, and that looked a little bit awkward. But that's when it all started to unfold. When all of a sudden the Prime Minister, I think uh, Prime Minister of London, England, uh, uh, Mr Johnson, uh, with Mr Biden, they were congratulating Mr Morrison on heading towards uh, net zero uh, reductions by 2050. And <laughs> didn't hand grenades go off back here? <laughs> oh, my goodness me, didn't they go off? And then I wake up to Phil Curry's story on the Fin Review on Saturday. It's on. Here we go again. And even I thought we were over this at least for at least for a couple of years, but no, it was on again. We've got a couple of civil wars going on in this building. We've got civil war going on between the Nats and the Libs, and that's always been going on. We have a civil war going on between the Nats and the Nats. I, <laughs> I said to the caravan, I, I really want to hear that what there's no civil war going on in between the in the Nats at the moment. No, that's why there's people out there, dead men walking, they'll think was the story and what goes on. And we see the rise to the top again. Here comes Mr Joyce. He's back. Okay, Mr Joyce is back. Mr Joyce, the champion of the farmers. Well, where do I start? So we know we know very clear where the gnats where the gnats are on Mr um, uh, Morrison's view of net uh, net zero carbon by uh, 2050. We know where we are. He's made it quite clear. We've had all the lieutenants out there, Mr Pitt, Ms. Uh, Senator McKenzie, out there on the after dark stuff on Sky and all that, sending out one hell of a kaboom to the uh, Prime Minister when he was offshore. But I must ask this question, and, and I have been on the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee for actually my anniversary comes up next week, 16 years, and I'm pretty happy to say, and I've been the chair of that 13 years, and uh, I've talk to a few farmers, and I don't pretend that I'm a farmer, I'm not. But I, I, I think to myself, well, I know last week I was doing a dairy inquiry on Friday, and the uh, red meat industry and the, uh, were all there, and they're talking about how we've got to get to net zero. We know the National Farmers Federation's um, stance on net zero. This is the National Farmers Federation, who I would have thought, well, I know they're joined at the hip with the Nats. Well, 
They were until I until the I heard the latest. But I just want to share with the Senate, if I can, please, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And you know more about farming. You've forgotten more about farming than I'll ever know. I, get, I give you that. But this is the 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 NFF's media release of the 20 of 20th of August 2020, and and they say the heading is net, NFF calls for net carbon zero by 2050, and uh, this is it. Australia's peak farm body has thrown its weight behind an aspirational economy-wide target of net carbon zero by 2050. Members of the National Farmers Federation have voted in favour of the landmark policy which includes strict caveats regarding fair implementation and economic viability and an online meeting this month. NFF President Fiona Simpson said the strengthening of the NFF's climate goals was a strong reminder of the role farmers already played in tackling emissions. And she quotes, or I'll quote what she says, Australia's farm sector continues to be a leader in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Ms Simpson goes on to say in the past decade, <coughs> excuse me, agriculture has consistently reduced its emissions intensity and net emissions within the Australian economy. The red meat sector, for example, has a target of being carbon neutral by 2030 and is already making great headway on research and new technologies that will enable that transformation. However, despite progress in the farm sector, Ms Simpson warned the goal of, and the, 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 UN, the number is NCZ, well anyway, you know what it is, it's the, the call for net carbon zero, would be just an aspiration without ongoing innovation and policy support. She goes on to say, we need to equip farmers with far better tools for evaluating and reporting on individual business emissions, Ms Simpson said. Then she says this will require new investment in research and development so we have more robust baseline information, new pathways to reduce emissions and fewer barriers uh, to participation in carbon markets. Action on climate change is a central part of the NFF's 2030 roadmap which sets a vision for agriculture to reach $100 billion in farm gate output by 2030. And the last statement is there is a huge potential for Australia to be a global leader in low emissions agriculture. Now, my question here is I would love to hear the Nats explain to the Senate and to the people of Australia that if you represent the farmers and rural and regional Australia, um, you are joined at the hip with, well, you're joined at the hip with a couple. You've got the National Farmers Federation glued this side. You've got the Australian Trucking Association, who, who, who I'm not part of, glued on the other side of your hip because that's been the dumping ground for failed gnats for years. How does or how do you explain the Absolute difference in opinions on net zero by 2020. I'm dying to see the Nats and the Libs go to an election with two different, completely different climate policies. Senator Stirl, please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. I thank Senator Stirl very much for that, uh, Dorothy Dixer. Um, uh, I will have about 10 minutes to explain why net zero emissions would be a very bad deal for our nation's farmers and especially for our rural communities. And they, and those conclusions that I make no problem, thank you. Uh, are just from very simple calculations and estimates from bodies like the CSIRO uh, and other uh, respected economic modelling. Uh, I want to start, though, by the fact that often with these motions, when, uh, when there is a quote from somebody, um, you could almost guarantee that that's a a misleading quote, or at least a, a quote which a lot of detail has been left off. And I, I know that in this case because while the motion identifies the culprit as Barnaby Joyce, who is this quote, in fact, the words were jointly authored by myself and Barnaby in an opinion piece in February this year in The Australian, where we do say, we did say the nationals have always been against a net zero emissions target, a target we've always been against, uh, stress, and, uh, and uh, we could not credibly support, uh, represent farmers if we would adopt such a target. The paragraph just preceding that quote, which wasn't included in the motion for reasons that will become obvious, the paragraph before that said in our opinion piece, the problem is that cows and sheep have a tendency to burp and fart large amounts of methane, a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. 
every cow emits about 2,300 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent gases a year. The CSIRO estimated last year that to reach net zero emissions, we would need to start with a carbon price of $30 a tonne now. Even a relatively small cattle producer runs about 1,000 head, so they would be up for a $70,000 a year cost under a net zero policy. Now, those that do advocate for net zero emissions do so quite often quite glibly. Uh, there's a lot of hand waving. It's going to great benefits. There's going to be lots of jobs. There's not a lot of detail about exactly what net zero emissions mean or how we're going to get there, but it's all going to be fantastic. Just believe me. It is the pitch from those pushing net zero emissions is the policy equivalent of the steak knife salesman on late night TV. There's always more. There's always more. It's always fantastic. It's so good. It's so good. It can hardly be true because it's not true. It's not true. Those figures I just quoted, they're just the facts. How will, how will farmers pay the 2.3 tonnes per head per year that they, their cows emit right now? How will they pay for that? Because what we didn't quote in that op-ed is actually the CSIRO and their modelling. It starts at $30 a tonne. It starts at $30 a tonne. It grows to $200 and $50 a tonne uh, by the end uh, of 2050. So Senator Stirl over there spent 10 minutes talking, oh, we'll get, to, we'll get to net zero emissions by 2050. Now NFF says it's fine, it's fine, fine. I don't think he knows these things. He doesn't know. He said he wasn't a farmer. He doesn't know how much, it, how much a cow emits. He doesn't know the fact that if, you, if you're going to charge someone over $200 a tonne uh, for, the, for the methane that comes out the front end of a cow, you are then going to be up for that 1,000 a head cattle farmer They'll be up for four hundred thousand dollars a year. Four hundred thousand dollars a year. What are they going to do? What are they going to do, Senator Stirl? How's that going to work? Who's going to pay for that? Well, it will be paid for uh, at your at the self-service checkout at Woolies. When you go there and, and swipe your rump steak, and it comes up, you'll have to put your pin in. You'll have to put your pin in because it's going to be over hundred bucks. It's going to be over hundred bucks. Every shop will be over hundred dollars, and you you won't be getting any free transaction approved. That's what will happen to Australian consumers if this comes off on the CSIRO's own figures. They're the CSIRO's figures. And look, worse, worse than this, worse than this. That's the impact on farming. But of course, of course, such a policy to get rid of emissions from our economy, from our coal industries, from our gas industries, from our factories, which we want to get more back, we want to get manufacturing back, don't we? They're all going to be paying for it. They're all going to be paying for it. And, and there's been no, absolutely no detailed economic modelling put before the Australian people about those costs. The CSRO did some costs on what the carbon prices would be, but not on, not on a proper modelling on what the impact on jobs or the impact on uh, wages would be to the Australian economy. In fairness, the New Zealand government did do, they did do such modelling. They did a computable general equilibrium modelling, which has its flaws, but it gives you a broad estimate. They did some modelling on what it would mean to the New Zealand economy if they were to reach net zero emissions by 2050. They made some pretty outlandish assumptions about um, some technology being able to halve methane emissions from sheep and electric. I think all the electric vehicle fleet, half the freight fleet, was going to be electric. But anyway, they made some some pretty generous assumptions. But even with those assumptions in the modelling, the, their modelling showed that by 2050 the New Zealand economy would be 10 to 20 per cent smaller, 10 to 20 per cent smaller, a fifth potentially smaller uh, than today. That there would be a two to four per cent loss of jobs in New Zealand as a result of net zero emissions. Now, if you translate that to Australia, the 4 per cent loss in employment in Australia, that would be 400,000 people. So before we just glibly roll off the talking points that all of you get in your morning inbox that net zero emissions is going to create jobs, it's going to be great, just remember that the respectable, detailed modelling that's been done would show that, five, that the half a million odd Australians would lose their jobs, would lose their jobs. Now, after that modelling, guess what? After that modelling was, was conducted, the New Zealand government exempted agriculture from their target. And in New Zealand, in New Zealand, half their emissions come from agriculture. <laughs> so their net zero emissions target is literally half pregnant. Half of it doesn't even exist because they're not even going to try and reduce emissions in half their economy. Yeah. I mean, this is why this is all a marketing pitch. Not real. It's not pragmatic. And if there's one thing I know about people in the bush and the country is they hate people with spin. They can see through this. They can see through this from a million miles away. 
that this is all, and you're better than this, Senator Subsell, you're much better than this, this is all slick marketing spin from corporate offices in Sydney because the people that will be make money out of net zero emissions, the people who really make money, will be those bankers in Sydney. They're loving it. They're loving it. Why did the Australian Financial Review have five stories on Tuesday morning bemoaning the fact that Barnaby Joyce was back, bemoaning the fact that net zero emissions might not come in? Why would the Financial Review be upset about that? Because our financial executives stand to make a lot of money out of net zero emissions. Because you have to define net zero, you have to create certificates, you have to trade them. And that's where the bankers make a lot of money. Good luck to them. It's a career. It's a career. But that's not what I want for our country. What I want for our country is that we bring back manufacturing jobs in this country, that we stop getting ripped off by China and signing up to deals uh, which they don't comply with. But we do. We do. Because the other thing that other speakers here that contribute to this debate need to answer is if we do sign up to this, because the whole intent of this is to lower emissions across the world, I mean, it doesn't matter what we do so much, but I accept if the rest of the world is doing things, we've got to be a good, uh, good contributor. But the whole point is for the rest of the world to act as well. It won't mean anything if they don't. Um, if we can't answer this question, Senator Stell put a question to the Senate, answer this question. If we can't trust China, to comply and cooperate with the health inspectors investigating coronavirus, how do you think we can trust them to cooperate with the climate cops that will have to enforce any net zero emissions deal? Is that real? Are people really thinking that the Chinese Communist Party can be trusted when they say they're going to reduce emissions, going to achieve net zero emissions by 2060? Is that a real position that people are putting? Do you really believe the Chinese Communist Party when they say that? Do you really believe them when last year they installed 38 gigawatts of coal fired, new coal-fired power stations last year in China? 38 gigawatts, double our, our, our coal fleet in one year. And then, and they, and then when they go to Davos, when, when Xi Jinping goes to Davos, he'll say, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm subscribing net zero emissions, and all these bankers who want to make money out of it, lap it up. Oh, how great. How great that China, how great that China is come and seen the light. What a load of rot. What a load of right. We have got to make sure we are not naive as a country right now. We cannot afford it. We cannot. Maybe in previous eras we could, but unfortunately the next gener generation of Australians may face a tougher time of it than what we've all uh, been growing accustomed to in our relative prosperous and peaceful era. Because we can see the threats in our region, the aggression in our region, and we need to make sure we adopt policies as a country that are made here in Australia not made in international agreements overseas for a class of people that want to make money off trading. We need to make policies in Australia here that will bring back manufacturing jobs to this country, that will make sure that we can be a country that can defend ourselves, uh, support ourselves and not be beholden to international agreements that worked, are worked out in overseas capitals that, do, that betray the interests of the wor average working men and women of this country. That is what we need as a nation. Uh, and that is what I know Barnaby Joyce is focused on, the Nationals Party is focused on, because we will always put Australia first. In this chamber here, there are flags here that represent this country, Australia. And so in this, in this chamber here, we should pass laws that are, represent that flag and this country, not the interests of those around the rest of the world. Uh, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, if we're going to talk about division and, and dysfunction, let's talk about the real cause. It's climate change ideology. It's an appalling, unaccountable ideology. It's the ideology which insists on reducing emissions at any cost, up to and including the demise of Australia's manufacturing, resource and agricultural sectors. It's the ideology which is based on little more than computer models which have, time and time again, never panned out in reality. It's an ideology which has empowered other countries to demonise Australia and threaten its economy and its very sovereignty. And it's the ideology which has stalked the coalition and Labor who have allowed themselves to be led by the nose to abandon the farmers, the miners and the businesses of our nation. The Nationals have once again been hopelessly compromised by this ideology. Memories appear to be very short in this place. In 2019, Queensland voters were decisive in delivering the coalition another term, and they sent a clear message the Nationals, in particular, will ignore at their peril. Queensland voters rejected climate change ideology. Queensland voters rejected the instability and dysfunction it has caused in Australian governments. 
They are sick of the major parties playing politics with this ideology. So they're not going to look kindly on this wishy-washy, will they or won't they approach by the nationals to net zero by 2050. Never say never, says the Minister for Agriculture about net zero. Different eyes saying the returning Barnaby Joyce. Farmers need a commitment. They need the nationals to come clean, not after a new coalition agreement, but right now. And the nationals in support of paying farmers to not farm? What's the point of the nationals if farmers aren't farming? They're abandoning their traditional base for a few cushy ministerial jobs. Farmers aren't going to tolerate this much longer. It's not just their livelihoods, but the life they and their families choose which are at risk. The Nationals have failed them on water reform in the Murray-Darling Basin. The Nationals failed to support the dairy industry in its crisis, and this is supposedly the party of farmers. Farmers' livelihoods and our food security must not be risked. The world's population is growing. Australia can and should play a leading role in feeding it. Our farmers are among the world's best. Yet here are the Nationals looking to tie the farmers' hands behind their backs by paying lip service to net zero. We need to let farmers do what they do best, growing quality food, looking after their land and injecting hard-earned export dollars into our economy and our rural communities. And it's so pleasing to hear Matt, Senator Canavan say, we need to get manufacturing going. That's been my saying for the last 25 years. Thank you, Senator Hanson. No, Senator Lyons. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, there you have it. We've just heard from uh, two senators uh, before me who are both uh, climate deniers. One of them is um, a senator who's a party uh, in government. The other is from a party that clings like a barnacle on a ship to the Liberal National Coalition. Um, and what we've seen since the return of Mr. Barnaby Joyce is um, chaos and dysfunction and nothing but looking internally. We saw a disgraceful debate in this place this morning on water. We saw the Nationals cross the floor on water yesterday. Uh, they've all been out regurgitating um, their issues about how they don't believe in the science of climate change. Well, I'm not interested in talking about the Nationals. Uh, but I do want to highlight the damage that the Morrison government, by refusing to commit to targets and by refusing to put a date on when we will um, have a proper carbon policy in this country, are damaging our country. And, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, one of the things that I do as a senator for Western Australia is I actually talk to farmers. I talk to farmers. I go out and listen to them. And they tell me. And I want to talk about a group of farmers and primary producers in Western Australia, uh, professionals and other organisations associated with primary production who are on the land and who have a view about what's happening. So I want to talk about a group who came together to form uh, a group they've called Ag Zero 2030. These are real farmers, not uh, pretend senators that we see in here who somehow uh, claim to speak for farmers. These are real farmers, real primary producers, professionals associated uh, with primary production. Ag Zero 2030. Look it up. So uh, they came together because what they want to see and their aims are to support our industry and communities to proudly and successfully adapt and thrive into the future while protecting and preserving our land and climate. Help WA play its part in global efforts to limit global heating to 1.50 per cent. Meet consumer preference. Retain market access. Retain access to capital investment. This is what farmers in Western Australia are saying, not the rubbish you, you hear from those opposite, not the rubbish, sadly, that you hear from the Morrison government. Let me just repeat those last two. Retain market access. Now, I just heard a senator in this place, a government senator, talk about uh, 400,000 jobs that are going to be lost. Here's farmers saying, actually, what we want to do through having a target on zero carbon emission is retain our markets, protect our land uh, and um, retain access to capital investment. So I'm not quite sure 
who the Morrison government and, in particular, the, the Nationals claim to represent. But it's certainly not these farmers in Western Australia, and it isn't, uh, it isn't primary producers. The National Farmers Federation. They want to see action um, on uh, carbon. They want carbon zero, and they've put a date on it. But I don't know why um, the Morrison government is allowing a handful of national centres who are clearly out of touch with what farmers and primary producers want to uh, control the agenda. And we've heard the awful sorts of comments that, that they've said. Um, you know, uh, just recently, Mr. Keith Pitt and I heard this myself. Said um, he didn't think uh, the Nationals would be supportive of a net zero plan. He said, "I'd think it'd be very unsupported." That was on Monday. Well, I'm sure the farmers who I've visited uh, in Western Australia, in the Central Wheat Belt, in the Great Southern, uh, in Esperance area, are appalled. I know they're appalled when they hear that. They are out there. Um, working hard as farmers do, day in, day out, looking for support from the federal government, looking for some hope that, that their land, the work they do, is valued and that there will be real action on climate change. And they tell me over and over again how disappointed they are. And I learn from them. Um, not only did WA lose its a barley market because of the shenanigans of the Morrison government, and that's what farmers have told me. Um, but we've got farmers in Western Australia saying, "Please um, do something on climate change." Well, it will not come from the Morrison government. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Scar. Well, Mr. Acting Deputy President, Senator Lyons must be speaking to different farmers than the ones I'm speaking to, and I must say, my good friend, Mr. Keith Pitt, Mr. Keith Pitt uh, is himself a farmer is himself a farmer, so there you go. Um, a real-life farmer with a view with respect to what is responsible climate change policy. Senator Ayres made the first contribution to this debate by talking about movies. And can I tell you, Mr Acting Deputy President, listening to this debate, I can see a sequel coming. I can see a sequel coming, a sequel of the 2019 federal election. That's the movie I see coming down the road, a sequel. And let me tell you what happened in the 2019 election in my good state of Queensland. This is how the workers voted. This is how the workers voted in my good state of Queensland. In the seat of Flynn, which includes Gladstone, home of the Boyne Island smelter, and a lot of other hardcore manufacturing industries, emission intensive, the Senate vote in Flynn, Labor got 21.5%. 21.5 per cent. That's how the policies of the Labor Party resonated with the workers in the traditional, used to be, used to be a traditional Labor Party seat based around Gladstone of, of Flynn. 21.5 per cent. Let's go north to the seat of Dawson. Again, it used to be a traditional Labor Party seat. 19.5 per cent. 19.5 per cent of the vote the Labor Party got in the Senate in what was blue collar heartland and Mackay, etc., 19.5 per cent of the primary vote. That's what your workers, that's what your workers think of the modern day Labor Party, which has walked away from their interests. It's walked away from their interests. And then we go to another, what used to be traditional Labor Heartland, Capricornia, based around Rockhampton. Labor Party Senate vote, 22.4 per cent. 22.4 per cent. So that's what the workers in North Queensland and Central Queensland think of the Labor Party's policies with respect to climate change. They're more interested in their jobs and the welfare and future of their towns and their families. So when Senator Ayres talks about movies, I can see a sequel coming. I can see a sequel coming. Because I tell you, I've been listening to the remarks from those opposite, the guffawing, etc., about Senator Barnaby Joyce, etc. I can tell you his message resonates. It resonates with the workers in North Queensland, Central Queensland and areas like where my Senate office is based, in the federal seat of Blair, federal seat of Blair home to many ex-coal mine workers, home to many ex-workers from railway workshops, proud people, blue-collar workers, and a lot of those workers don't identify 
with the modern-day Labor Party, and they're right not to identify with the modern-day Labor Party. I'd love to hear what the acting deputy president. Senator Stirl says uh, behind closed doors in Labor Party meetings. There was a lot of discussion about what happens in, in my party's uh, party room meeting earlier today. I'd love to be on the, a fly on the wall when Senator Stirl no, no doubt speaks a lot of common sense, a lot of common sense behind closed doors about how important it is that the Labor Party stay true to its worker heritage. But it started to move away from that heritage. The person, the person who's prepared to come out and speak publicly, of course is Joel Fitzgibbon. Joel Fitzgibbon in the Hunter. And what did he say? What did he say just yesterday in relation to what the Labor Party did last night in this place, voting against a number of sensible reforms which would allow money to be spent on clean technology, including carbon capture and storage, etc. This is what Joel Fitzgibbon said, and I quote from an article by David Crow, June 23 in the Sydney Morning Herald. And I quote from uh, Mr Fitzgibbon. We shouldn't be picky. It's not just about windmills and solar panels, he told radio station 2GB. It's about all sorts of other innovation, including electrical vehicle charging station rollouts, improving the efficiency of heavy vehicles, and capturing the carbon so that we can use capturing the carbon so that we can use gas and coal to generate energy without polluting the atmosphere. All these things will make a contribution. And we shouldn't be fighting about which innovations we choose. We should be using as many of them as we can. Mr Fitzgibbon went further in the interview by saying it was, and I quote, and I want to give the, I want to give the last word in this debate to Mr Joel Fitzgibbon of the Labor Party of the Great Hunter region of this country. He said it's ideological craziness for Labor to oppose those changes. Thank you, Senator Scalia. The time has expired. Uh, now, um, the time for discussion has expired. I shall now proceed.